Chapter 3. Municipal Democracy, Ancient and Medieval Let us examine some of the pivotal episodes in the tradition of direct democracy. The Athenian Polis In the 7th century BCE, Attica, the city of Athens and its surrounding territory, was a city of bitter class enmity. A tiny group of aristocratic families ruled the area, while the large number of small farmers lived as virtual serfs. These oppressed peasants were required to pay their overlords a large proportion of their annual crop, an obligation that often drove them into debt and bitter material want. As Plutarch tells us, the, quote, common people were weighed down with debts they owed to a few rich men, unquote. For non-payment of the debt, the consequences were often dire. Quote, Many parents were even forced to sell their children or to go into exile because of the harshness of their creditors. Unquote. In this intolerable situation, the demos, a word that is used variously to mean the common people and the people as a whole, neared the brink of revolution. Despair impelled them to find someone who would quote, set all enslaved debtors free, redistribute the land, and make a complete reform of the constitution, unquote. Attica nearly exploded into bitter civil war, but eventually, in 594 BCE, all the contending clans agreed to elect Solon as their archon, or chief magistrate, to bring order to the polis. Solon proceeded to cancel all outstanding debts and make debt slavery illegal. Upon his election, in fact, he was given an extraordinary commission to alter the Athenian constitution and prevent new crises from arising, but the laws he promulgated changed the city's political structure so radically that, in effect, he forged a new constitution entirely. Most consequentially, Solon revived the Ecclesia, a popular assembly whose existence dated back to tribal days but had paled to insignificance in the intervening centuries. Under his regime, the Ecclesia was not only resuscitated, but its functions were expanded, as it gained the authorization to enact the community's laws, elect its magistrates, and meet regularly at its own instigation. Finally, the new archon gave the common people the right not only to attend the Ecclesia's meetings, but to vote on the issues that were deliberated there, a crucial step towards empowering the demos. In addition to the Ecclesia, Solon created a new council of 400, called the Ball, to handle the administrative side of Athenian self-government. To be sure, Solon was not an unalloyed democrat. He retained a certain elitism in the Ball by allowing only propertied men to belong to it. This elite prepared the Ecclesia's agenda and supervised its deliberations, but Solon's Ball served at least to check the power of the aristocratic Areopagus Council, through which the wealthy families had once ruled Attica as they pleased. Other Solonic reforms expanded individual rights and established a popular court to hear appeals. In a further blow at oligarchy, the wealthy families were obliged to relinquish their hereditary claim to provide Athens with its archons, opening the door to executive power for the demos, but perhaps the most striking maxim imputed to Solon was his belief that any citizen who, as Plutarch put it, quote, in the event of a revolution, does not take one side or the other, unquote, should be disenfranchised. It affronted the Hellenic concept of citizenship for a man to selfishly wait to see which side would prevail in a conflict. Athenians were expected to be politically involved, to take sides during civic disputes. Having made these constitutional reforms, Solon went into voluntary exile for ten years. Despite recurrences of considerable civil unrest, the citizens of Athens nevertheless absorbed his changes and grew accustomed to the ecclesia that he had expanded and empowered. They infused it with political vitality and developed a political etiquette that fostered civic commonality. Gradually, the Ecclesia came to be accepted in most quarters as the ultimate decision-making body in the polis, paving the way for a general democracy. In the half-century after 561, the tyrannies, 
not a pejorative word in those days, of Peristratus and his son, Hippias, further reduced the power of the Attic nobility. In fact, many of the Athenian democracy's features must be seen as institutionalized efforts to prevent the resurgence of the aristocracy. Although the aristocracy repeatedly tried to restore its old clannish oligarchy, it failed to eliminate the reforms of Solon and the Pisistrade. Indeed, recalcitrant nobles were forced into exile, and their estates were divided among the landless poor. Meanwhile, precisely through their participation in the structures of Solon's constitution, the political level of the Athenian citizens was raised enormously, making them ever more sure of themselves and of their capacity to govern their own affairs. The extraordinary opening of political life that created this self-confidence reached its apogee between Cleisthenes' archonship, beginning in 506, and the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War in 431. Cleisthenes, in fact, launched the democratization of Athens in earnest. Although he kept the Areopagus council intact, he struck at the social basis of aristocratic rule, the traditional kinship network of the Attic nobility, by divesting the clans of their powers and eliminating the traditional Ionian system of four ancestral tribes. In place of the old system, he created about 170 demes, units based not on the kinship but on residence. In so doing, of course, he recapitulated the urban revolution in situ, replacing tribalism with propinquity as the criterion for membership and making citizenship inseparable from territory. The demes soon became vibrant multiple centres of local democracy, each one with its own popular assembly and its own council and other officials all chosen annually. This new institutional structure, which consisted of the demes and some larger units that the demes composed called trites, as well as quasi-tribal units that Cleisthenes kept in order to make the transition easier, revolutionised political life in Attica. The ecclesia, the citizens' assembly, was now indisputably the seat of all political authority. All male Athenian citizens were enfranchised and could participate and vote, free of property qualifications, regardless of class and status limitations. Their political right were entirely equal, rich and poor alike, such as Pericles could declare, quote, Neither is poverty a bar, but a man may benefit his polis, whatever his obscurity of his condition. Unquote. Further constitutional changes made in 462 removed the last remaining traces of privilege from Athenian democracy. The Areopagus Council lost much of its former weight when many of its powers were distributed among the bull, the ecclesia, and newly established popular democratic courts, where citizens sat in large juries, like miniature assemblies, for almost all civil and criminal cases. In its prime, the Ecclesia was an outdoor mass meeting of many thousands of male Athenian citizens, convening at least 40 times each year in meetings that usually lasted a single day. All could participate in open but orderly debates, according to the principle of Isagonia, or the universal right to speak in the assembly, and all could vote, which was done by majority rule. Their decisions affected all matters of public policy, including war and peace, diplomatic treaties, finance and public works. Insofar as the polis had leaders, like the strategos, Pericles, their terms were brief, usually one year, and their actions were constantly supervised and judged by the assembly, which held them to the level of accountability that prevented a self-perpetuating elite from emerging. But most positions were chosen by lot. In fact, sortition rather than appointment or even election, became the most widespread means of choosing officials in nearly all political institutions. The head of the assembly who presided over meetings of the ecclesia was not only chosen by lot, but held office for only a single day. Ball members were chosen by lot for terms of one or two years, while even archons were chosen by lot from members of the ball, as were members of juries and other functionaries. That sortition could be used so extensively presupposed a high level of political competence on the part of ordinary citizens. Such a presupposition, in fact, was eminently justified, for under this system a large proportion of the male citizens of Athens 
gained direct experience in democratic self-government. It was under this system that the city's cultural life flourished, begetting the well-known flowering of philosophy, drama, art, history writing, physics and biology that constituted, quote, the glory that was Greece, unquote. The Medieval Commune A millennium later, long after the demise of the Athenian polis, the Roman Empire had fallen and the feudal system lay like a dead weight over most of Europe. Although the Romans had founded many towns in Europe, they had no longer places of political activity. The church physically preserved many towns, but mainly as centres of the ecclesiastical power. After AD 1000, however, in northern Italy, the Rhone Valley, the Rhineland and Flanders, a new merchant class began to emerge in the interstices of feudalism, and these innovators began to breathe new life into the medieval towns. Between the late 10th century and the first half of the 13th, the towns, or communes, that they revived became centres of lucrative commerce and craft production. Initially, the commercial and craft towns remained under the sovereignty of the older authority in whose domain they were located, usually the church or account, and continued to be a subject to external rule. But gradually, the ecclesiastical and noble authorities were less and less able to address the local needs of the commune residents. Church laws, in particular, were irrelevant to commerce, when they were not restrictive of it. Ever more averse to complying with external control, the communes arrived at their own ways of handling taxation, marriage and inheritance, among other things, and developed their own legal systems, guaranteeing their inhabitants' personal liberties and limiting their princes' rights in fiscal, judicial and other matters, until they were eventually managing their own local affairs, de facto, if not de jure. Inevitably, the communes demanded that their sovereigns recognise their local liberties, demands that normally met with a refusal from the ecclesiastical and princely powers. In turn, during the 12th century, many communes began to free themselves from their sovereigns. In northern Italy, a group of towns calling themselves the Lombard League rebelled against the Holy Roman Empire to gain their liberties. By the Peace of Constance, signed in 1183, the Empire granted recognition to the several towns of the League, permitting them to elect their own officials, to make their own local laws, and essentially to govern themselves. What were the communes? They were essentially associations of burghers, merchants, professionals and artisans, who swore an oath, or conjuratio, to respect one another's individual liberties, and to defend and promote their common interests. The conjuratio was, in effect, an expression of citizenship in a distinct civic community. The earliest communal institution of the Italian towns, in fact, was a general assembly of, quote, all the members of the commune, unquote. This assembly approved statutes and chose an executive and judicial magistrate who, for a term of one year, was charged with the administration of town affairs. As the communes grew in population and size, more artisans were needed to craft goods necessary for local use and regional trade, such as barrels and vehicles, and service workers were required to supply food and lodging. Rural people who gravitated towards the towns to seek refuge from feudal d duties and to improve their living conditions took up this work. But before 1200, they usually did not share in the commune's political liberties. For the most part, the communes were not complete democracies. Membership was restricted to the founding families and their descendants. Although all resident adults were subject to rule by the commune, they were required to pay taxes and to serve in the militia. Not all of them were permitted to be politically active citizens. Active citizenship depended on property qualification, length of residence and social connections, as did the right to hold public office, a right enjoyed by only a tiny fraction of the male population. Indeed, in the 12th century, political power was developing along patrician lines, so that by 1160, in most communes, certain families were preeminent in civic affairs. Even as the communes as a whole were fighting for their autonomy from feudal lords and bishops, these patricians dominated the magistracy, manipulated the assembly, and basically ruled the city, with the results that the civic assembly steadily atrophied. This situation did not last long, however. Around 1200, 
democratic sentiments began to stir in many communes. At Nimes, for example, in 1198, the entire people elected their magistrates. In the Italian communes, the popolo, the master craftsmen, shopkeepers, professionals, notaries, tradesmen, financiers, commercial bourgeoisie, but not the weavers and labourers, confronted the aristocracy with demands that communal political life be expanded to include their participation. In various communes, the popolo formed neighbourhood movements of vocational guilds that interlinked men of the same occupation. These guilds were soon supplemented by armed popular societies, also organised by neighbourhood. The mobilised popolo now clashed with the nobility in towns such as Brescia, Milan, Piacenza, Cremona, Assisi and Lucca, among many others. To a remarkable extent, their revolts succeeded in radically democratising communal political life. Between 1200 to 1260, in the number of communes, including major towns like Bologna and Florence, the popolo actually took over reins of power. Pavia's council expanded from 150 to 1,000 members in the same years, and Milan's grew from 400 to 900, while at Montpellier, the guild organisations actually fused with the municipal government itself. This dramatic process of democratisation was reflected in the writings of the Aristotelian philosopher Marsilio of Padua, who wrote, quote, The legislator, or prime and proper effective cause of law, is the people or body of citizens, or its more weighty part, through its choice or will orally expressed in the general assembly of citizens, unquote. In the northern cities, by contrast, Democratization of communal life occurred more slowly than it did in Italy. In Freiburg, after a popular revolt, the commune mutated its oligarchy into a board of 24 magistrates, elected annually, while Liège created a guild-type city republic, and after 1313, made the issuance of new laws contingent upon approval by a popular assembly, composed of all citizens regardless of status. However, in Flanders, in cloth manufacturing Ghent and Ypres, civic self-government was shaped by the weavers and fullers. Organised into so-called lesser guilds, these working people, virtual proletarians, waged a veritable class war against their patrician exploiters and ultimately triumphed over them, establishing a civic structure that gave considerable rights both to themselves and to low-degree guildsmen, and excluding most patricians. Even at their most democratic, however, the popular communes of Flanders, the Rhone Valley and Italy still did not give equal political rights to all male citizens. They excluded the unskilled, the poor, field workers and most immigrants who they felt were dependent people and therefore easily controlled by wealthy merchants and aristocrats. Nor was the democratising process long-lasting. In time, these early democracies yielded to republican forms of governance and political power reverted to the influential families, with the result that the communes later ended up with rule by oligarchical councils or by elites such as the Medici in Florence. However incomplete the medieval communes' democratisation may have been, it aroused the dormant political realm from its slumber and set it in motion for several centuries in piazzas and other public spaces. As such, these communes constitute an important moment in the developing tradition of direct democracy.